Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Congresswoman Kathy Castor and Chair of the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. Uh, we have a, a strong uh, presentation delegation this morning, but uh, uh, thank you, Speaker Pelosi, for, for bringing us together again. At the outset, I'd, I'd like to say on behalf of our delegation that it has been very inspiring uh, to be here at the COP, to see countries working together in common purpose, uh, to meet our climate goals, to especially to reduce pollution and emissions. This work is very hard when you're asking countries across the planet to come together in common purpose for a common goal. Uh, but it is absolutely necessary to our survival and our ability to stave off the rising costs and the escalating impacts of the climate crisis. It has been especially inspiring to see here at the COP the diverse voices from across the globe, from every corner of the earth, all continents, vulnerable nations, indigenous people, young people demanding action. And I want them to know that we have heard them uh, what we've also heard here at the COP uh, from other countries and other policymakers is how pleased they are to see the United States of America back uh, playing a constructive role in partnership uh, with them and hammering out the very difficult path forward. This uh, high-level delegation that Speaker Pelosi has brought here to the COP uh, really the Congress is here to demonstrate that we are doing our part to ensure that, that President Biden is successful when he sets a new goal of reducing pollution in the United States, our emissions by 50 to 52 percent by 2030, and then getting to net zero no later than 2050. We understand our role, and that's why looking ahead, we are poised to pass the most significant a clean energy infrastructure climate bill in the history of our country. But we're here today also to provide a little more detail on that and what, what lies ahead with a number of our uh, climate champions here in the Congress. Uh, Congressman Earl Blumenauer, Congresswoman Betty McCollum, Congressman Jared Huffman, Congressman Adriano Espelat. So I'll turn it over to Congressman Blumenauer of Oregon and the Ways and Means Committee. Thank you, Chair Castro. We are in a race against time. I came here uh, buoyed by the experience I had with Speaker Pelosi in the first uh, select committee. Uh, it took on new urgency for me this year with the horrific events. There was one day this summer in Portland where temperatures in the heart of my district hit one 180 degrees. People died. But the United States came to this conference with the leadership of our Speaker, our President, an unprecedented package of legislation that we have moving forward uh, to help mobilize the resources that are necessary. What's happened with the investment community, what's happened with individual businesses, uh, and the legislation we have. I return to Capitol Hill energized about what we are going to get across the finish line, and most important, by the young people that we are engaged with here who are not going to let people forget the commitments and the urgency and build on the uh, remarkable achievements that we have going forward. Congresswoman Betty McCollum uh, of Minnesota and the Appropriations Committee. Thank you. I have the uh, honor and privilege of chairing the subcommittee of appropriations that deals with the defense investments. And we're very focused on, on national security. And climate change and what's happening around the world is very much part of that national security footprint. So uh, we have made significant investments in the House bill. We're going to be going to conference. But uh, it was a top priority. We have new funding and climate investments that includes vulnerability, uh, resiliency, science and technology, looking forward to what, do what we can do in the science and technology and also transfer that information to our allies and those around the world. 
um, because we know in the Department of Defense we have to reduce our footprint on fossil fuels. We need to um, reduce our footprint on greenhouse gas emissions. And most importantly, we need to work on energy resilience and conservation. We've really dug down deep into that. Out of that learning, we can also have uh, working with uh, technology with the private sector and share what we learned to reduce greenhouse carbon footprints, not only in the Department of Defense, but throughout the U.S. government, and hopefully share that with our allies around the world. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Congressman uh, Jared Huffman of the Transportation Committee, the Natural Resources Committee, and very importantly, the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. Uh, Jared Huffman of California. Thank you. Chair Castor used, I think, the most important uh, word I can think of when we talk about the climate crisis, uh, action. We are beyond uh, being inspired by possibilities, by ideas, by advancing the debate. Uh, this is a decade of action, and you know the stakes uh, of inaction have become all too clear. Um, so in order to translate our work into action, and those of us in the House of Representatives have a critical role to play, um, we need some inspiration, we need some optimism, we need to stay motivated, and we got plenty of that here at COP26. Uh, I think many of us uh, were very energized after our meeting with Secretary Kerry yesterday. Uh, because his optimism is palpable, and so is his incredible substantive command of every single issue at stake in this climate crisis. And so uh, I am grateful for the opportunity to be here with our impressive American delegation, uh, a delegation that is not just back in, but all in and leading in incredibly uh, effective ways. Uh, and we will take that sense of optimism and inspiration back with us to Washington because we've got work to finish uh, in the House and in the Congress uh, to make sure that we are all in as well. Thank you. Right, next up, uh, Congressman Adriano Espiat of New York and the Appropriations Thank you. Uh, we've heard voices uh, in this last couple of days from those uh, that contribute less but are hurt the most, uh, from uh, women, from indigenous people, island nations, uh, developing countries, uh, poor people, and working class people that are really uh, devastated by climate change. And I guess uh, we try to connect the dots on how the discussion here impacts uh, back home, uh, how does it impact that child that suffers from asthma, how does it impact uh, uh, that home that's flooded every time it rains, uh, how does it impact the quality of life um, in the districts that we represent? And so uh, we've tried to find the collective will uh, to not only enact public policy, but also to find financing to address uh, these issues globally. So uh, this has been a productive discussion. Uh, and although there's been some uh, absence uh, of certain nations here, I think that the voices of those uh, disproportionately affected have been very strong and will lead the way uh, to ensure that we have, we build back not only better, but that we build back green. Very good. And uh, so now at this point, we're happy to take any questions. Hmm? Yes, ma'am. Uh, they've been asking me to me. Uh, hi, I'm Zach Coleman uh, with Politico. Um, just want to say that the G7 countries have committed to ending fossil fuel subsidies by 2025. The IMF said the fossil fuel industry is grabbing subsidies totaling $11 million per minute. There's legislation in the House to end these subsidies right now. Um, so, Speaker Pelosi or anyone who can answer this, uh, what's the appetite within the caucus for actually taking that up and voting for it on the floor? I've been trying to get rid of those subsidies uh, for as long as I've had a, been in a position of, uh, to do so. Uh, right now, we have tried to counter, to offset what that is. You have a situation where uh, some of the leading fossil fuel companies, leading oil companies make a trillion dollars a year. They need no incentive to drill, but there is in the Congress still support for them to have that in order to offset that, 
to recognize that that shouldn't be. Um, just speaking personally now, uh, I, we have in the legislation uh, our goal. We have a goal. We have a vision. We have a goal. We have a timetable. We have milestones. And what our purpose is is in our legislation uh, to reach those milestones, whether it's by 2030 for 50 percent. That is what we will what we will do, and that's what our legislation enables us to do to reach the president's goals, our goals. We're in that position because of the work of the Select Committee. The Select Committee has been a, a well, champion, a, 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 and many of the members are here, some on this panel. You heard from some of them yesterday, the uh, uh, 2018 class has many members on the, on the panel, and they had their own press conference yesterday. You heard from our, our, our chairman yesterday. We heard from some our distinguished chair of the caucus lead, of the co select committee leading us today. So we, we have our vision, we have our timetable, we have our milestones. We will meet them without that. But I think that that should be something that's always for consideration. If, if I, thank you for your question. If I may, Madam Speaker, just to elaborate briefly, I've had that legislation in the House uh, for years. Uh, and as you know, there was progress going forward, but we were dealing with the reality of the Senate. That, that was not going to happen with this immediate package. But that's not the end of the game. This package that we have moving forward is going to result in dramatic impacts, and this is a path that we're going to continue on, which you've seen in terms of the reaction from many in the private sector. So we're not giving up on that. There is, a, I think, an overwhelming majority of the House that would support it, but we're going to deal with the realities in the Senate now and go forward. Good. Next question. Hi. Thank you very much. Uh, Amy Cassidy for CNN. Um, question for Speaker Pelosi, please. Um, is America really back yet if it won't sign on to a global pledge to phase out coal by 2030? And members of your own party say America has not recovered its own moral authority and action needs to be delivered. Thank you very much. Well, of course, I don't accept the fact that America has not uh, assumed its moral authority in all of this. America is back. Our president was here. Uh, he had achieved, there were many uh, successes that were achieved in collaboration not dictation or condescension, but in collaboration with other countries, many of whom were ahead of us because we had, of course, the dark period of, uh, of four years uh, preceding the president's, uh, President Biden's administration coming into office. So we have great confidence. We have great uh, absolute hope and optimism that the goals will be met. Uh, President Biden was the first person in Congress, he tells me, and I take him for his word. Uh, Al Gore may have another date, but uh, the President's <laughs> first legislation was in 1986 to address the climate crisis. Uh, this is a priority for him, not only a priority, a value. So uh, people will say what people will say, uh, but we know uh, that America is back. We've been yearning to be back. In fact, many of us went to um, Spain, uh, to, to Madrid, for the previous COP25 uh, to say, we're still in, even though uh, the previous president was pulling us out. Uh, but you don't have to be in to be in. You, you have to act to be in, using the word Mr. Mr. Um, Hoffman used and our distinguished chair used uh, across the country, whether it was state state or local governments were all moving in that direction. The mayor's initiatives on climate were very positive. Governors in my own state of California, but other states as well, governors did not wait around for the White House uh, to share that important value of saving the planet for the children. Could, could I just uh, speak to that? Um, look, I, I think, I hope, one of the things that you're hearing from our delegation here uh, is not just a willingness to ask the rest of the world to step up and do better. Uh, we have to do that in the United States ourselves. And you're right. We are not there yet. We have disconnects. Uh, we are putting together the most historic 
package of, of investments and climate action that our country, maybe the world, has ever seen, and yet within it, um, we continue as we tackle methane, for example, to, uh, to address it by throwing money at the fossil fuel industry to incentivize them to do what, frankly, we would like to do using other tools like just penalties and regulations. There are just political constraints and realities we're still trying to navigate and you can point to contradictions and inconsistencies and inadequacies and all of that, but I hope what you're hearing uh, is a resolve to step up and do everything that we possibly can, and we will get there. Good. Next question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this press conference. My name is Julia Arana. I'm from South America, from Comunicarse, Chile. I have two questions. The first one is, uh, can you give me more details about uh, this proposed bill about a carbon tax, $20 carbon tax uh, you may propose? Uh, what uh, I need some more details uh, and how optimistic you are to prove this uh, proposed bill. And the second question is, we were uh, expecting to hear in former President Obama some mention about a hundred billion goal uh, for finance. Uh, we didn't hear it. We also didn't hear it in uh, actual President Biden. Um, can you uh, tell us what are you doing to push forward to uh, um, complete this goal? Thank you very much. I think I'll ask Mr. Blumenauer to address the, the first part, and then I can address the, the um, climate financing. Uh, in the short term, it's going to be very difficult to have a carbon fee or a carbon tax in the United States. We continue to have that on the table. We're looking at other areas, for example, a carbon border adjustment, which is gaining more uh, attention and momentum. We've had conversations with our friends in the European Union who are moving forward. There are alternate ways to be able to do that. In the short term, because of the dynamic we're facing in the Senate, that's not going to happen. In the long term, it will. And there are these other mechanisms, like the uh, carbon border adjustment, that we can proceed with. In and on the uh, international climate financing, President Biden announced in uh, the U.S. International Climate Finance Plan during the Leaders Summit in April. Uh, this includes the administration's intent to double by 2024 the annual public climate finance to developing countries relative uh, to the average level during the second half of the Obama-Biden administration. So th what we'd like to do, have U.S. agencies working with development partners prioritizing climate in public investments, enhanced technical assistance and long-term capacity, align support with country needs and priorities, and boost investments in adaptation and resilience. The U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, will release a new climate change strategy. Uh, they were, that's imminent here at the COP, and uh, U.S the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation will update its development strategy to not only include climate for the first time, but also make investments in climate mitigation and adaptation a top priority. What, what you're seeing here is building back after the previous administration had taken us out of the Paris Climate Agreement, but also took us out of our commitments that we've made under previous administrations to support international uh, climate goals. So we are we're building back better in the Congress of, on clean energy, but we also have a responsibility to build back better when it comes to keeping our commitments to the international community, and we intend to do that uh, Ma with President Biden. Madam Chair, if I may, on the, uh, Mr. Espelot, you go first. Hay un compromiso con la administración Biden de de llenar el, el vacío que existió por los últimos cuatro años con referencia al financiamiento eh, y entendemos de que, que los Estados Unidos está eh, atrasado en, en, en los pagos para llegar a los mil millones de, de dólares, pero hay un compromiso y una voluntad política para llegar ahí. If I may add to what our colleagues have said, the, uh, Mr. Greg Meeks is here with us this morning, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, and he has 
legislation that is ripened and ready to come to the floor uh, to address our responsibilities uh, for sharing resources, financial, technological, in so many ways, uh, to help other countries. That is our moral responsibility to do so. Uh, I'm completely unaware of any deal on uh, carbon tax, but I do know that it is something that is talked about and may be a, a, um, an option for the future. It is not in our legislation now. Our legislation is predicated on making everyone pay his or her fair share. Good. Next question. Thank you for your question. Oh, if I just may add one more thing. In, in the course of all of this, when our earlier um, select committee and the rest, um, we did visit Chile and talked to and listened to the indigenous people there, and that has always been part of our visits and our conversations on this, starting with the indigenous people, the vulnerable throughout the world. So thank you for your question. Hi, it's Ellen McMeyer from the Associated Press. Thank you for doing this. Um, you've mentioned Senate realities and political realities that prevent immediate action on things like um, cutting fossil fuel subsidies and also, uh, I assume, uh, joining in any effort to um, in domestic use of coal, right? Um, there's not any any sign in the midterm that you know those are going to get any better for for Democrats. And in the meantime, you know we're in the last few years of um, supposedly enough having enough time to act to cut emissions significantly to stop the worst of climate change. So uh, how how do you reconcile that, and, and when, when do you see that getting better so that the U.S. can take those bigger steps? The, the package that we have going forward deals directly and immediately with being able to reduce carbon emissions. This is the most ambitious package that we've ever seen. The legislation we have coming out of Ways and Means making permanent our tax credits for energy conservation what's happening with the electrification. There are all of these areas where we are investing unprecedented sums of money to be able to follow through on American commitments. We'll duke out certain things in the long run. Uh, the coal industry is dying in the United States, not because necessarily of regulations, which Donald Trump unwound, but because of economics. Renewable energy, which we are in providing unprecedented incentives for, is more economical. That's the rational decision that business and communities are making. And so we're going to pursue long-term policy changes, but in the short term, what we are putting money behind, investments of our government, and what we've seen commitments from the private sector, those are uncontrovertible. And that's where we're, we're headed, and it's going to have a tremendous impact. It really, truly is a remarkable package. Here are just a few, a few of the details, and I, I think Mr. Blumenauer is right. There, there were a number of different pathways um, here. So here are a few of the pathways that, that we chose in the Build Back Better Act. Uh, out of Frank Pallone's committee, $29 billion in a greenhouse gas reduction fund for nonprofit state and local climate finance institutions that support the rapid deployment of low and zero emission technologies, with at least 40 percent of those investments going to low income and disadvantaged communities. A methane uh, emissions reduction program to con that's focused on the oil and gas sector more than $15 billion in multiple loan and grant initiatives at the Department of Energy. That will support those innovative technologies. Remember, under the Recovery Act in 2009, that package had $90 billion of clean energy investments. And that uh, really got us going. But compare that to the over $500 billion in the Build Back Better and, and put together with the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, another $500 billion investment in transit and rail, and again, targeting resources to communities on the front lines that have suffered a disproportionate 
a burden of pollution. There, this is just a different, this is a different pathway along with the, the tax credits that are revolutionary. Combine that with the economics, uh, this, is, this is our answer. This is an inspirational, transformational package. And even in the face of close, close numbers in the U.S. Congress, we intend to deliver. And we, we know that we have to answer our moral call to action. And that's why we feel here, being here at the COP in constructive partnership, uh, we're hearing from other countries that they are so enthused that America is back and working with them in a constructive way. With action, as Mr. Huffman said. Yeah. Real action. If I could just add on to that, um, I, I hope one thing you're taking away here uh, is that when you bring up these political constraints, and, and believe me, many of us wish we could be part of the, uh, the end of coal and that pledge. Uh, we wish we could uh, have a carbon tax. Uh, we wish we could do all kinds of things, but instead of just throwing up our hands because of these political roadblocks and not taking action, we are finding ways to navigate those problems and still take action. We're tackling every one of the major elements of this climate crisis in, in a bigger and bolder way than we ever have. But we have never been absent. A certain branch of government was absent for four <laughs> years, but we were there in Madrid and we're here today, and our leadership in, in methane has been impressive, and our fiscal commitment in the recent uh, Build Back Better uh, initiative uh, proves that you know we'll here for, we're here for the long haul. Uh, we, uh, because of the constraints of the room, we only have time for one more question. Who's, who's calling? <laughs> Uh, thank you all for your time. Francisco Camacho of the Daily Times. Um, you're talking a lot about these obstacles that you are facing. I myself write for a newspaper in a small county in East Tennessee. I mean, around 70% of the county voted for Trump, voted for an agenda that claims that climate change is a hoax. So what would you all say to that part of America that still either doesn't believe in climate change or doesn't believe it's so much of a threat? And what would you want to see out of those local governments, out of those counties and out of those cities to help address the problem? If I may just say, the most eloquent argument about climate change is the vicious storms that many of these people have suffered. The wildfires that are existing in the west, the storms in the south and the, and the, uh, of the east coast as well. Uh, the droughts that people are feeling in the country. That's more eloquent than anything that we can say uh, that something else is happening, and it's happening more intensely because of human behavior that must be changed. Uh, I, again, it's a bit, uh, overwhelmingly the American people understand the climate crisis and are supportive of actions for us to manage it and to solve it. I have great confidence, as the President Obama said and others have said here, in young people. The future is theirs. We have a responsibility to transfer a planet to them in a responsible way. Uh, so we prayerfully approach those people because they are many people of faith, as am I, who believe that this planet is God's creation, and we have a moral responsibility to go be good stewards of it. But as I say, those storms hitting home are uh, such an important message. And, and central Tennessee saw it vividly in terms of unprecedented storms, people dying. Uh, I mentioned what happened in my, we've all seen it, but central Tennessee, I think, was exhibit A. In, in fact, what the, America just this year has suffered over $100 billion worth of damage from climate fueled disasters. And, and they're right, you, you cannot ignore people who died out west due to wildfires or the, the drought, the intractable drought in the southwest, floods in Tennessee, Hurricane Ida that, that stormed ashore again on the coast of Louisiana and cut power, but then proceeded on to, to the northeast where people in New York City were, died because they were flooded out of their basements, or even the freak storm in Texas freak winter storm that, that froze up the 
electricity supply and Texas wasn't con connected to the grid and people died because of coal? Weird in Texas because the, the grid wasn't resilient. But here's what we do know. No matter what your political affiliation is, people want clean energy. It's much more affordable. It's a lot cheaper. And you don't have the impacts of pollution, that, whether that's asthma or the, the air that we breathe. People want clean energy across America and across the globe. And that's what our historic package, Build Back Better, and the Infrastructure and Jobs Act is going to provide. We're going to deliver. When people suffer these losses in storms, we have moments of silence. We will not be silent on this issue. The narrative across America is one about saving the planet for the good health of our children, clean air, clean water, about good paying green tech jobs to make us preeminent in the world and in our communities to have work, uh, as Mr. Espelot talks, talks about all the time, workforce development. It's about our national security, conflicts caused by drought and other, other um, Disaster, uh, natural disasters are, uh, create competition for resources and for habitat, and again, a national security issue to end conflict, and it is also a moral issue to pass the plan on uh, to future generations. But I have great confidence that young people, younger people, even grade school kids, understand this better than some members of Congress. <laughs> uh, we will learn, the children will lead the way. Thank you all very much. Thank you all.